next, Bob Mumgard, CEO of Commonwealth Fusion Systems, joins us. Hello, I'm honored to be speaking today about an up and coming energy source, Fusion Energy. I think we're all familiar with charts like this. This is the future of the electricity market. It's yeah. been clear for a while that the world must deeply decarbonize and reach net zero emission by 2050. This requires a massive multi-trillion dollar scale up of zero carbon technology. An emerging consensus is this will require both the continued scale up of solutions we already have in the form of intermittent renewables and new energy sources that can contribute to decarbonization. And here, this wedge represents the sum of those required efforts. And the scale of this challenge simply cannot be understated. If you plot that on a log graph for the installed power versus time, we get exponential curves like this. And that orange wedge becomes this installation rate here compared to the historic installation rate for fission and wind and solar. A few things need to be understood about that wedge. First, this installation rate is steep. It's the, we need to build power at a rate at least twice as fast as anybody before. Second, it must not have any barriers to scale. Note the accidents in nuclear power limited it to about 20% of installed capacity. Whatever comes next must not hit natural or social limits. What's clear is that the solution is going to require disruptive technology. And here's a great representation from RPE of what that looks like. Here, the cost per performance is on the y-axis and the time on the x-axis with existing incumbent technology on the incremental curve. And RPE seeks to see new options that can then scale to these new curves if they get cheaper and faster. And this innovation can solve the biggest challenges, putting new options on the table. And one such option, the option the universe has chosen, powers all the stars and built all the elements in us, is fusion energy. And fusion combines the light elements into heavy elements, and in that process, which occurs at very high temperatures and conditions that are like inside of stars, it converts mass to energy, a lot of energy. Per weight of fuel, fusion creates 200 million times more energy than burning carbon. That's enough fuel on Earth to power all of civilization for the life of the planet, and it's freely available and equitably distributed in water. This process is the opposite of nuclear power, the opposite of fission, where one splits the atom. With fusion, there's no chain reaction. There's no transuranics, no long-lived nuclear waste, and there's nothing to melt down. And it's long been the dream to harness this as a power source. And this could have an, a profound effect on climate because fusion, unlike all the other energy sources, is not about a resource. It's about a technology. If you know how to build a machine that can create the necessary conditions inside it, then one can have dispatchable, zero emission, high quality heat. This can then be coupled to make electricity, hydrogen, desalinate water, or drive an industrial process. Furthermore, these machines can be sized to fit the energy market and local conditions. They're grid scale. They can be used to repower thermal sites. There's no inherent limitation to manufacturing them beyond the knowledge and ability to produce them. But there's a catch. We have not yet built machines that can produce more power from fusion reactions than it takes to create the conditions necessary, we have not reached break-even. However, the worldwide community is surprisingly close. Here's the figure of merit for fusion energy, the triple product, which needs to be above a threshold for Q greater than one. Note that the leading fusion concept, the tokamak, rose fast across the decades, faster than Moore's law, but stopped short, and we await the arrival of breaking through this historic barrier, something that we call Eater, which has long been in the plans. Now, Eater is the largest scientific collaboration in the world, including the US, EU, Japan, Korea, Russia, China, and India. It's a large tokenite with a price tag over $30 billion and a multi decade timeline. And multiple blue ribbon science reviews have concluded that it will produce over 500 million watts of heat with a fusion gain of over 10. The science is sound, it's a statement of conviction that fusion is possible and worth doing. However, it's not on a commercial power plant, uh, and it's not on a timeline to get there. The primary problem is scale. The tokamak itself is the size of an office building, and the plant is a monumental undertaking. But there's been a profound shift in fusion energy. You know, along the province of government research, it's now breaking into a nascent industry. And there's now many companies that have been funded by the three recent RPE fusion programs, 
and see the opportunities for additional funding through new, innovative cost share programs like the one recently enacted into law and awaiting launch. Propelled by the science done in the national labs and universities, uh, these companies have backed, been backed by over $2 billion of private capital. That's, that's more money than in all the small modular reactor companies. And they're utilizing advances in materials and technologies to prove new ideas and ways to achieve fusion energy in a commercial form. And I'm going to tell you about one of these companies, Commonwealth Fusion Systems, and, and our journey to harness one such innovation. And that technical change occurred outside of fusion, but is very relevant for climate. It's the invention and com commercialization of high temperature superconductors. This new material, the result of thin film manufacturing similar to solar, has a unique property. It's largely insensitive to magnetic fields. Whereas the previous technology had a limit. You couldn't build arbitrarily strong magnetic magnets. This material allows you to do that. And CFS and MIT have developed this material into a new generation of superconducting magnets for fusion. And now, because tokamaks are basically big magnetic bottles, this has a profound effect. With these magnets that are twice the field as before, we can now build a tokamak at 1 50th the scale of ITER and reach the same conditions using the same highly validated science. And these magnets act like you know, a shrink ray for the cost and therefore the speed and commercial attractiveness of fusion energy using the traditional route. And so this sets up an entirely new development pathway for fusion energy, one based not on uh, advancing plasma science, but on harnessing new magnets. And this is what CFS was built to do. Building off the current record holding tokamak after CMOD at MIT, CFS and MIT have developed full scale, high temperature superconducting magnets at twice the magnetic field of the previous generation. And now we're embarking on building Spark, the world's first net energy fusion demonstration. And this paves the way for a machine we call ARC, a commercial product to put 200 megawatts of electricity on the grid in a package that can scale. Now, if we go back and we think about disruption, you know, here is the major radius, the, so, the sort of the scale and size versus Q, the performance of the existing mainline program versus time. And what these high field magnets allow us to do is come up with a very disruptive trajectory. Um, we can take these steps much, much quicker. And so this is what we've been working on. And CFS um, was built on serious people taking fusion seriously. In the last three years since spinning out MIT, We've raised over $250 million for fusion commercialization from leading investors like Breakthrough Energy Ventures and energy companies like ENI and Equinor. We have grown to more than 150 employees, including our collaborators, it's over 300 people. The team is diverse, hungry, and cut their teeth at universities and building rockets and, and other cutting edge technologies. And across our four locations, we have scaled the high temperature superconducting supply chain, developed manufacturing processes, and designed Spark and are designing ARC. And we're just on the verge of our main milestone, which is demonstrating a full-scale, high-temperature superconducting magnet at high field. The magnet reaches over 20 Tesla, 12 times that in a traditional MRI. It contains over 300 kilometers of superconductor, and each of the 16 layers in it is the world's largest high-temperature superconducting magnet. We've developed the manufacturing processes, and we've assembled the magnet, and we're on track to demonstrate it next month. And this is, why, this is widely seen as the key step in taking this high-field transformation of fusion energy and unlock the next step, spark. But we're not waiting to start Spark. The Spark tokamak has been designed according to the same plasma physics basis as the world's academic programs have already demonstrated in tokamaks. It's the same design principles as ITER, but at a fraction of the size. The physics basis has been peer reviewed, 11 institutions co-authors, and if Spark works, that says that, or if the magnets work, that says that Spark will work. We've procured the site and permits to build the machine and the site is under construction. And by 2025, we think we'll have a prototype of a fusion power plant up and running at nearly full scale with the capability of producing over 100 megawatts of fusion heat. This then opens the door to the fusion era. And Spark proves out the manufacturing supply chain for ARC, a commercial power plant. We're anxious to move forward on this machine as soon as possible. And this is all in line with recent blue ribbon panel from the National Academies of Sciences that recommends the United States embark on an aggressive fusion energy development program to build just such a pilot plant in order to ensure the U.S. does not fall behind other nations who are moving much more aggressively towards fusion energy. Now, this ARC design is then scalable to meet the needs of the energy transition. And it's hoped that you know, our ambition, but it's a very ambitious plan, but scientifically and technically sound plan, we can unlock fusion as an option for deep decarbonization in the 2030s and beyond, when the world will desperately need it. And it's this type of effort that we hope you watch out for in the coming years. So thank you for your, your time and please don't hesitate to reach out for questions or, or further discussion.